He's the most exciting character in the saga for me. You don't know what he's gonna do. I'm a terrible person. He's reckless. He does these stupid things that should never work. And they do. I'm fine! <laughs> and he does it with bravado. Let's go, 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 go! Welcome to Cord Killers, our mission to report the intel from the front lines of the cord cutting revolution so you have the information you need to be able to watch what you want, when you want, where you want, on whatever device you want. Me? I'm just Tom Merritt. Yeah, me? I'm just Brian Brushwood. But you know who was that we that we saw? He spoke eloquently. That's, uh, that's uh, the new solo featurette. And what I dug about it is that they seem to be emphasizing a starry-eyed, optimistic version of Tom Solo. Er, Tom Solo. <laughs> that's, that's you, Tom. <laughs> Oh, uh, not not the bitter, jaded Tom. Who Merritt are you calling we, yeah. Scruffy? <laughs> no, but but like uh, what they're saying is like like they they seem to have him as a starry eyed kid who tries uh, for these optimistic goals and somehow makes it. And of course, that is so antithetical to the jaded, uh, uh, skeptical uh, cynic that we meet in A New Hope. Yeah, I mean, this featurette gives me an idea of a Han Solo movie that shows me a different part of the Star Wars universe, even though it's got Han Solo, Chewbacca, and Lando in it, which, I don't know, I, maybe it will be good. We I should think, ask I, our guest. Yes, we should. Uh, I, I, please, I, you can introduce her better than me. Uh, joining us uh, is former Borders employee. She worked at Tech TV. <laughs> Uh, and uh, now, of course, a host at Twit, uh, Megan Maroney. Huzzah! Uh, I was once a young Han Solo as well. Um, mm -hmm. And see, this is where I am now. This is what happened to me. <laughs> uh, so, so are you optimistic about the Solo movie? Do you feel like there's any chance it's going to be good <laughs> because because i know i know all of us have had this guarded you know keeping it at arm's lengthness through the whole development well i've gone in with low expectations of all star wars movies um except for the first three um you know the first that came out in the 70s and sure. the 80s when i was young before Since you had then, expectations to give yeah i think maybe i had high expectations of the ones that came out in the late 90s the the prequels oh, and then that's the last is, time yeah. i had high expectations I yeah I, i've definitely then. had my heart guarded ever since then where it's just like yeah we'll see we'll see mm -hmm. it's gonna be 27 more movies and i'll be like i don't know maybe one I, I, we'll see I, I had my heart broken once yeah so i love the new ones i enjoy i enjoy enjoying them and ignoring the fact that they have several problems um, mm. Yeah, I, uh, I usually Tom is usually the first person I text after I see uh, the Star Wars. I think definitely this last one because I had some strong thoughts or, were, about were, were you, were you pro Rose. or anti on on The Last Jedi? Pro. OK, because I wanted to, you just have to like, you know, you just have to live that way. You have to yeah, yeah. love what you love. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I loved all the surprises, the subversion of expectations, the whole thing. Enjoy Star Wars like no one else is watching you. Exactly. Talk about yeah, Star it, Wars like you're a cynical old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> no, talk about it like there is no Reddit. That's what yeah, I always go. say about Star Wars. <laughs> Well, uh, we've got more Star Wars to talk about. As a matter of fact, it's our primary target. Disney and Lucasfilm announced the next Star Wars animated series will be called Star Wars Resistance. Of course, it will be produced by Dave Filoni, who produced uh, Clone Wars and Rebels. It will be set shortly before The Force Awakens, kind of the way The Rebels was set shortly before A New Hope. Kazuda Jono is an ace pilot recruited by General Leia Organa and trained by Poe Dameron. Isaac uh, is voicing Poe Dameron, Oscar Isaac. Uh, the recurring villain will be Captain Phasma, voiced by Gwendolyn Christie. BB-8 will apparently show up, and they'll do a slightly different animation style, and they've done that each time. They've changed the animation style a little bit. This time it'll be a mix of 3D animation with some cell-shaded anime kind of uh, influenced animation. Debuting this autumn on the Disney Channel, and if you're confused, this is separate from the live action series that John Favreau is working on that is coming late 2019 to the Disney app. This so, is Dave Filoni, animated, coming to the Disney Channel. 
chronologically, do you, uh, do you know where, where the two are, are situated? This one, obviously, shortly before The Force Awakens. Uh, yeah, we don't know anything. As far as I know, we don't know anything official about the live action series. Okay, and then how, how do you, I guess the other thing that surprises me is that this will be on the Disney Channel proper instead of Disney XD, the way Rebels was, yeah. which, I, which I rather enjoyed because it allowed Rebels to skew to a slightly older demographic than I would expect that we would see on the Disney Channel. It probably limited the audience though, because Disney XD is is a is an off channel, right? It's right. not the channel. And some packages will put Disney Channel in your main tier and XD and other things in, in an upper tier. So they probably want to get it as widely distributed as possible at this point. So how excited are you for exploring? Like, like uh, Megan, did you have burning questions uh, coming out of The Force Awakens of like, well, who's the resistance and what's the First Order? I, like, do you feel like this is fertile territory? Do you feel like this is going to be more the same? I think it's pretty fertile territory. I did have some really burning questions, but basically I'm in for Oscar Isaac because uh, I think he's a great actor. He's also a great voice actor, so I'm interested uh, in in that. Um, I don't know if you guys listened to Homecoming, the podcast from Gimlet that was that he starred in with Katherine Keener. They, I think they made it into a movie, but yeah, he has a great. He's he's not only nice to look at for me anyway, but he's uh, a great voice actor. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, what, what's the elevator pitch on that podcast? Uh, it was, I think one of the first like uh, dramatic podcasts. Um, well, not the first, but you know, the first to be a uh, big, like from Gimlet, I, uh, Gimlet says they're the first to do everything, but of course they came, we know they came long after we all did, of course. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think they sold it to HBO, um, as a, the story, they, basically the, the story is it's like a secret government project. Um, that uh, involves you know, uh, veterans, and Oscar Isaac is one of the veterans, and Catherine Keener is the the um, sociologist or the the, uh, the the person that works with him. So I highly recommend. I mean, you know, you, it's free. You can, if you you have car rides, I'm sure in your life, um, you can still download it. And it's on season two, uh, and season two is not as good as season one. <laughs> So right. not to distract from the things, but I, I thought I would throw in some uh, some of these things this week that I have listened to as sure. opposed to all the things I haven't <laughs> yeah. so, seen or watched. Uh, Tom, what about you? Are you uh, what's your enthusiasm ranking on this? I know you you stuck through with Rebels all the way to the end, and I know my daughter did. I, I'm the one who fell off uh, two or three seasons in, and it paid off. Yeah, it finished strong. Uh, the final final episode, I'm still. I'm still processing, to be honest, because of the way they finished. But uh, I, I trust Dave Filoni to create characters that I can care about on their own, no matter where they are. Uh, so I'm I'm positive about that. If anything gives me pause, it's that he is starting with two known characters, which he didn't do in Rebels. Now, in Clone Wars, obviously they did because they had Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. Uh, so so I'm curious how that's going to work. But it it feels like what they're going to do is say, we'll have Poe Dameron uh, kind of setting things up. Then we'll have Kazuda be the main character. Probably we'll have a cast of characters around to support. Uh, and then they'll, they'll do battle with Phasma, which... Phasma is actually an interesting choice because we haven't seen her that much in the movies. Her movie parts have been limited. So there's a chance to expand on that character and tie it in with some of the things that have been happening in the comics and the books. I, I, but, but really what I want is just like, give me another cast of characters like Ezra Bridger, like Kanan Jarrus, uh, like Harris and Dula that, that I will learn to love and care about. Yeah. I got to tell I didn't you mentioned Sabine, who's my favorite. <laughs> so, you know, well, so uh, so Clone Wars, you had a case where you have fertile territory that began with the prequels and had unexplored territory going forward that would lead us into uh, a new hope, right? Like that, that was well, all. No, Clone Wars was between uh, uh, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Sorry. Okay. So uh, yeah. okay. So, you so, were so actually so more that limited case, by that. Yeah, that that case, your book ended beginning and end. Rebels, you de had a definite end leading up to uh, right. a new hope. And in this case, uh, we have a similar setup on this, where where we have a definite end with the Force Awakens. So that's that actually gives me heart uh, about uh, or heartens me to make me think that this is going to pay off because this uh, this is a game they've played before. Uh, man, the only question I have is whether or not they could continue to set up all those Poe Dameron zingers that uh, there's no way he could be as clever or as funny week after week the way he was in the movies. Every right? week he'll be like, 
Kazuda, give it everything you got. <laughs> and he, he keeps doing the same Skype trick to where you're like really annoyed with it. You're like, oh, he always pretends like he can't hear you on the other line. No, that is never going to work. No one's ever going to fall for that. <laughs> uh, well, that's uh, yeah, that's good I, news. I, no, I think this will be fun. And, it'll give them, and apparently they'll take some of the other crew like Snap Wexley and work them in as well. And they'll, they'll be interesting. Maybe with Grunberg will get some work uh, doing some VO. I, I think the most interesting thing is choosing to put it on Disney Channel, though. Uh, as far as cord cutting goes, because you can get Disney Channel on Sling TV and, you know, multiple services, but it's still that you would think they would reserve this one for the app as well. But they're saying, no, we still need to hit that cable audience. So we don't want to throw all our eggs in one basket. Well, and keep in mind the move to the app and the uh, uh, I don't know, the closed ecosystem is a speculative move on their part. Uh, you know, Disney's money. Uh, in broadcast and on cable still, you know, they, they're very, very entrenched in a traditional way to do things. So it does make sense that they would diversify and maybe make two properties, one closer to the traditional stuff, the other one more speculative. Yeah, I'd call the app kind of a hedge and 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 not putting everything on the app is also a hedge, right? You know, it's just spreading things out. Right. Now, we, on the other hand, don't do that. We we put all our eggs in one basket at patreon.com slash cord killers, and we need your eggs. Yeah, it's called a smart financial <laughs> investment. Uh, financiers everywhere say put all your eggs in one basket, and that basket should be patreon.com slash cord killers. Dave Ramsey the other day, somebody was asking, how do I get out of debt? He says, I don't know, but step one, give money to cord killers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jim Cramer was saying that on Mad Money <laughs> a, the other day. Uh, 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 Larry Kudlow on CNBC <laughs> was saying it the other day. Yeah. Uh, uh, they they all say the same thing. Give a dollar or more at patreon.com slash cord killers and everything else will work itself out. That's true. Would you take actual eggs? Because I might have a few left. <laughs> you know what? Yes, we I mean, will. We are not out. proud. <laughs> I'm not I've, using them. I've tasted Brian's <laughs> omelets. They're good. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to taste my omelet, then give us eggs or lacking eggs a dollar an episode at patreon.com slash cord killers. This is a complicated <laughs> sell. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that. And now, how do I? So uh, a couple different studies out here uh, showing the shift in viewing behaviors. First of all, uh, who was it on Twitter that was like, can I be excited now uh, about, uh, about Oh, that's, the right, that's right. Uh, specifically, they said, uh, can we celebrate the death of cable or something like that? And Tom, being as politic as always, said, uh, well, let's not celebrate anyone's demise, but it is good that we have more choices. No. But yes, you can. Uh, because <laughs> Charter lost 122,000 TV subs in Q1. Comcast lost 96,000 thousand in Q1. DirecTV lost 188,000 subs in Q1. Total cable subscribers declined 3.4% over the course of 2017. No one's saying, oh, it's the housing market because the housing market's really strong. Uh, it's just happening and it's happening slowly. It's not dramatic, uh, but it is siphoning off and different companies are taking different tactics. We talked last week about how AT&T uh, announced that, hey, we're going to do this free television service called AT&T Watch. Uh, they didn't give us a whole lot of details about it, but they, you know, we're going to give that to cellular subscribers. Comcast is doing a thing where they're increasing the speeds first uh, in some markets for people who have TV subscriptions uh, as a reward for staying with them. So you're going to see stuff like that, but inexorably, People are shifting away from cable TV. So what are they doing? Conviva, which is a video AI platform, announced the following streaming estimates. Streaming video hours grew 114% year over year to 5 billion hours. In North America, it grew 174%. App-based viewing is up 136%. Apple TV had the biggest growth. It's still not the most popular platform, but it grew 709 percent to 256 million hours. Roku's still the most popular, but it also grew 87 percent to more than a billion hours. Android was up 168 percent. iOS up 138 percent. Mobile leads in the number of plays that are initiated at 42 percent, but TV sets lead in the number of hours at 54 percent. And Brian, that kind of makes sense to me. Uh, more people would try things on their mobile and then switch from thing to thing. Whereas if you're watching on TV, you start your thing, you watch the whole movie or the whole TV show. So 
it's finally over, Tom. In in the previous eight years of us talking about this topic, there had been every other quarter. It was first a story about how cord cutting is on the rise, followed by a story of just kidding. Traditional television live over uh, over the air or over cable is how people watch their stuff. The fact that this is a double whammy of not only just all of the cable providers reporting significant losses, but the fact that on app viewing is increasing even faster. The fact that the, the fact that the growth in in the over the top networks is so much, I I feel like it's indisputable at this point. Like uh, Megan, is is this finally the time that we can uh, hammer the last nail in the coffin? For I mean, if the, the, we hammer the last nail into the writing on the wall <laughs> of the uh, <laughs> how many other metaphors are there? <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean, I think there's still the sports. I think there's still the sports ball fans. Um, I, you know, I, I have been uh, a cord cutter back, you know, before there was Netflix streaming because I tried to get rid of TV, even though I worked on TV. Um, so I I haven't not cable has not made sense for me for over a decade. But I know I'm I'm one of one. And I also have you know, my parents live around the corner and they have cable. So I get to um, watch it over there. But I think that is the that's uh, it's still the sports people. I don't know anybody besides the live sports people that are and they have options now. You don't have to have cable TV to get all the live sports. You can get all the ESPNs, all the Fox Sports, Comcast Sports. They're all available online. It's just a matter if you live in the right place where you can get an affordable option. Uh, so sports is a lagging is lagging behind the, the other uh, alternatives out there. You're absolutely right. But we've gone from, well, you just can't get sports to like, well, you can totally get sports. And if you're in the right area, you might even save money getting sports online. Yeah, but it's still too complicated for the average person, I think. I mean, for those people that have had I mean, cable all it, this time that haven't switched over, um, I feel like those are the people that are like, nah, no, I can't, I can't manage. I, 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 we're all talking about, you know, like our parents, basically, right? Like my uh, in-laws, I think for them, they still enjoy the simplicity of turning on the television and being able to watch. Uh, in, in my father-in-law's case, it's golf. In my dad's case, it's watching the news because he likes, he likes that constant waterfall television of, uh, here's the latest thing to be outraged about. Um, I, I just, now the good news is both my in-laws and my parents have, have over the last two or three years really gotten into Netflix originals. They're, they're starting to explore the built-in Roku's to their smart televisions and that kind of stuff. But I agree with you, Megan, I'm, I'm not seeing them give up the simplicity of the traditional cable, uh, experience anytime soon. The simplicity has shifted. It's, it's now simple to get a subscription, especially if you live in a major city. Uh, you can do Hulu Live, YouTube TV, PlayStation View, Sling TV. Uh, you sign up, you get all the stuff. Uh, with, you know, a couple of niggling exceptions here and there, but they mostly all have all the things that most people want. Uh, so the simplicity has shifted to what you're talking, what you guys are talking about, which is, oh, but I have to buy a box and I have to turn on that box and and then I have to open an app to get to my television. And even though for us, that sounds silly, like how, how hard is that, right? It's it's not the same as like, I love the waterfall of television where you turn on the TV, it was already on Fox News and I can just sit back and get outraged, yay. Right, right. <laughs> well, and keep in mind also, it's, it's not an insignificant thing to, uh, yes, it's insignificant financially to buy a box uh, for, for, for most people. Yes, it's insignificant uh, to, to click two extra buttons or whatever what's not insignificant is altering your habits on a permanent basis when you get home from work you know what you do you press the outrage box button and it turns on with some outrage for you the idea of changing that to consciously coming home and having decision fatigue because i think that's that's the biggest thing that that people associate with the cord cutting movement is the idea of like oh now i have to be curator of all my own stuff how am i going to know what to watch i already trust these four channels and I enjoy just shifting around and landing on something that pleases me. Well, if we could just teach all of our conservative relatives that the outrage button uh, can be Twitter just as easily. Then... <laughs> That's, oh, a really good, mean, that's a really good I don't point. think it's just my conservative relatives. I think also my liberal relatives. Uh, they love to watch their MSNBC and get outraged. Yes. So Yes. Well, my there's, in-laws uh, there's outrage are outrage for them both. all. This, they, they, like, there's one room that's MSNBC, the other room that's Fox News, and they've been canceling out each other's votes for years, and it's weird. But, yeah, I think that um, – 
I think you a couple episodes ago, you guys were talking about uh, the difference between when we were growing up. It mm-hmm. was only the rich people that had cable. And uh, then, you know, Brian, you said uh, you, you Tommy were able to correct Brian's in, politically incorrect use of the word poor people. <laughs> but I think <laughs> it's sort of the same thing now, because if you're just adding if you're getting um, HBO now and Hulu and, you know, the PlayStation and you're getting it, it really adds up. And it's only the people that aren't concerned about how they're spending money that really want to. Uh, because otherwise you are really curating it. Or if you're just like, oh, I do everything, you know, e- either the people that aren't concerned about money or the people like you guys who do a show. And so you have to do everything. So I that's do think a, it's really the opposite. That's an interesting thing, because unlike cable, which was started with like, you know, at, at the top end and then percolated down, uh, cord cutting started at the bottom end and is still growing from the bottom end of people who say, you know what? I don't want to pay 90 to $120 for cable. I'll just pay $10 for Netflix and I'll live without because what cord cutting does is it gives you choice. If you have to replicate that exact package, then it piles up. But if you're saying, look, I can't afford that exact package, but you know what? I can't afford $10 or maybe I can afford $20. I'll get Sling TV, right? And, and live without some of the extras. It, it's building up at that end of the market, as well as the people who are like, you know what? I, I actually can afford to put all of my packages together and then have the ability to cancel Showtime easier and bring in Amazon Prime and use that. Uh, so I think that's why we're seeing this slow shift because it's being eaten from both ends. And in the middle are the people waiting, saying, well, hold on. When is it easy? When can you tell me the thing that I should get? Because we haven't got there yet. It's like, well, you can get a Roku or an Apple TV or maybe a Fire TV or maybe an Android box uh, and you can get PlayStation View or Hulu Live. Uh, but you also need to get this other thing and this thing if you want to get that show. Uh, I think we're over the next five or 10 years going to see the consolidation of all of this into a few competitors with a few choices It'll be more choice than we used to have, more control than we used to have, but it won't be the confusing, complex mess that we have now where it's like, what was CISO? Is that even still around? And then where do I get Handmaid's Tale? And why, you know, that that's confusing for a lot of people. So I'll tell you what, it's interesting on the flip side, because we talked about the the appeal of waterfall television and tr- and not interrupting your habits. We are seeing aggressive efforts on the uh, on both Netflix's part and YouTube's part to institute this autoplay going on to the next thing to remove the burden of the decision, to remove the intentionality from stuff. You know, I'll fall a few months behind on Red Letter Media and, and just click and I'll be playing Hearthstone, listening to 40 minutes of movie reviews, and I'll love the fact that it just automatically goes and plays the next one in the queue or the, or the next associated best guest for me. But uh, with that, all of that in mind, I think uh, Megan hit the nail on the head. We do need to preach the gospel of equal opportunity outrage to all of our elders. <laughs> yes. And absolutely. I, by the way, hate that. I hate when it auto plays. Um, and, you know, I hate when it auto plays on Netflix, but worse is YouTube. Like, I just hate the idea of that you're constantly fed like an IV of everything that you're interested in in YouTube. And you could literally spend the rest of your life watching stuff that, and not even bad stuff, like stuff that's interesting. Well, And, and that's, that the, that's the thing is like, I don't blame you because like, if you're going to fault it, fault it for being too good at every, yeah. uh, too good at figuring out what you like and too addictive to stop watching. So basically <laughs> they're hilarious. out televisioning television at that point, right? <laughs> Yes. The exactly. old joke was 100 channels and nothing on I want to watch. Now it's one channel and I can't stop. I, and I can't get out, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I can't. Yeah. Somebody else has to do it for me. Like I can't. They're, they're too good. Uh, one last thing I want to mention because because you brought it up as far as the simplicity aspect that I, I think is a bigger – I don't know if it's a barrier, but it's a bigger adjustment than I expected, which is the need to stop the video before turning off the TV. Those used to be the same thing. You turned off the TV and it was off, right? I had to teach Eileen like, oh no, don't forget to close the app before you turn off the TV because PlayStation View will just keep running yep. using bandwidth. Not that we have a bandwidth cap, but I'm like, it's just, you know, it's just bad, bad hygiene for your internet to, to have something streaming well, like but, that. Well, also bad hygiene for your watch history, which is increasing. Oh, right. Be- that too. Because you don't want your, your reputation with your uh, Apple box to, to be corrupted, basically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I I don't think that'll ever change. That is something people have to get used to. In fact, it was funny. We were watching something on TV uh, over the air broadcast uh, and Eileen was like, how do I close this? And I'm like, 
You, you don't. <laughs> but we've been we got so trained to that that it was like, wait, I, I can't close the television. I keep turning the TV on, and it's just farther in the story. Tom, it's how do still, I make it it's stop? It's still streaming. I can't stop it. <laughs> All right, let's talk about what to watch in under surveillance. It's all about location. Danish horror series The Rain has a trailer out. The series is about a world in which rain kills you. It arrives on Netflix May 4th. Like special rain? Haunted rain? Yeah, there's something in the rain. It's a disease. And it, you know, it, yeah, acute allergic reaction possibly. Something that you, you never really know from the trailer, I don't think. Yeah, there, it seems like the water gets infected and that infects the rain. Yeah, there's Got a virus it. in the water. And so, so, so there, there's post-apocalyptic some, sort of. Some vir- viral videos in the, yeah. in the, in the droplets. <laughs> it's anti, it's anti uh, water world. <laughs> it can't be in humidity. It has to be in water form. Like really obvious droplets, apparently. Seems legit. Mm. And as soon as it touches you, it kills you? Uh, no, it infects you. you infected. And, and in fact, there's it a infects scene in the you at a rate where... exactly perfect for a 40 minute per episode series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it. There's a scene in the trailer where someone gets her foot wet and they're like, kill her. She's infected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sense8 finale movie arrives on Netflix June 8th. Uh, this is going to wrap up the cliffhanger ending of season two. Bryce, did you stick all the way through to the end of Sense8? I did not even finish the first episode. Oh, uh, Tom, what about you? I got through season one, then missed that season two came out like a lot of people did, and I haven't caught up yet. Yeah, they also had that Christmas special, right? I yep, didn't see that, that either. I, I, I really liked what they were tickling at, but uh, but but felt like it didn't move quite as fast as I would have liked. But, Megan, but, did you watch it? No, not not a second of it. But so I, we are not the people who <laughs> wrote it and made Netflix. We are the problem. But but <laughs> I, you could tell, like it makes sense to me that that they would Sense8. that they would it would make sense eight to me that people would get really passionate about it because I like the characters, I like the situations. Yeah, yeah, same here. Amazon ordered a second season of Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, and if you're like, oh wow, I haven't had a chance to watch season one, nobody has. It hasn't premiered yet. Comes out August thirty first. Oh, right on. Uh, this has got John Krasinski. As I was Jack about Ryan. to say is that, that that guy looks uh, that Jack Ryan looks a lot like John Krasinski. Yeah. Well, we he doesn't have to be quiet, quiet in this one. <laughs> uh, and then Natalia Tena, who played Tonks in Harry Potter and Osha on Game of Thrones, and Tom Felton, uh, who was Draco Malfoy in Harry Potter, was also in The Flash. They will star in YouTube Red's Origin. Uh, Paul W.S. Anderson of Resident Evil fame is directing. The show is about Lana and Logan, passengers on a stranded spacecraft heading to a distant planet. Debuts later this year. Dude, I'm so stoked. I love the fact that uh, that both Netflix and YouTube are making possible so many curious, uh, bold uh, sci-fi stabs. And I, I don't know enough about this to, to know if it's curious or bold, but I certainly hope so. Megan, Tonks and Draco? Uh, I, I was a fan of both of them in Harry Potter, a very big fan of their work in Harry Potter. But no, I uh, I don't have YouTube Red. There's never been any like I feel like I must be not their demographic at all. There's never been anything I've been interested in watching on YouTube. The Red. one thing that's almost got me onto YouTube Red is that upcoming uh, follow up to the Karate Kid with uh, with with Daniel and uh, the Cobra Kai uh, mm-hmm. dojo thing as adults. That sounds pretty good. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, at, at CinemaCon last week, Paramount announced sequels for Star Trek, Cloverfield, and A Quiet Place. Uh, the new Star Trek they're talking about is not the Quentin Tarantino one, uh, but will be directed by S.J. Clarkson. She's directed episodes of Jessica Jones, The Defenders, and Life on Mars. Variety says their sources say her Star Trek movie will be about Chris Pine's Kirk meeting his father, who, if you recall, was played by Chris Hemsworth before he became well-known, and apparently they've got him back, and there's going to be some time travel, apparently. I just want to say, for the record, that I so, so wish it was Star Trek colon Cloverfield (laughs) instead of a comma in that headline. How great would Star Trek Cloverfield be? (laughs) The ship Cloverfield. (laughs) They go back in time to to Earth. Yes, see, Megan gets it. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Pine, Megan. Are they not the same person? Is no, that what you're different. Saying? Okay. Yeah, different. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I don't also. remember that he played him in the the first Star Trek. He was his in, dad in, in that that very very opening vignette, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Yeah. 
it was one of his first roles. Like he, he then later on got Thor and you know, all these other meaty roles. Uh, but he was an unknown when he was cast as Kirk's father. So Hollywood reporter says Netflix has ordered a documentary series from Buzzfeed called follow this. It's a 20 episode, 15 minute ish weekly that will feature Buzzfeed reporters on multiple topics. They, they showed a clip from an episode about ASMR. Uh, so that's, it's like, you know, kind of Buzzfeedy kind of stuff, but News magazine, short news magazine from from the the reporting side of BuzzFeed, which, you know, when people think BuzzFeed, they think 15 things that will astound you. But there's also this investigative journalism side of BuzzFeed. And that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. And uh, there's a number of articles that I've run across on the investigative journalism side of BuzzFeed that have made me very pleased with the work that they're doing. And I think that this is smart, uh, fertile territory for them to go. Like if, if they're exploring, if they're explaining our own world to us, our own world, of course, being, you know, the Internet and YouTube. Uh, I think they're pretty, pretty good at that. Yeah. This is like, I don't know, the New York Times doing a series on CBS in 1970s, right? Like, yeah. Or or like Vice on HBO, though, right? Isn't it sort of more like that? <laughs> more recently, Vice on HBO. Yeah. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. It's exactly the same thing as that. Yeah. Uh, Netflix ordered a 10-episode series called Another Life, starring Katie Sackhoff. You may remember her as Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica. She plays astronaut Nico Breckenridge, leading a crew investigating an alien artifact. The series was created by Aaron Martin, uh, who did the TV series Slasher. What was the other show that, that Katie Slack, uh, Sackhoff did uh, recently? It, it only lasted a season or two. She was the bad guy in it. Um, mm. Yeah, somebody, everyone's going to write us at courtkillers at gmail.com and remind me. I'm just looking it up on IMDb. Hey, that's a smart way to do it. She, uh, uh, I want to say. you keep talking. Yeah, yeah I want to <laughs> say it was a science fiction. Wow, she's done a lot of work. A lot at, of yeah. films. Um, Doggone it! It was it was a woman. Uh, it was a female lead. Robot chick. What's that? No, robot that, chicken. Not robot no. chicken. I mean, maybe. Don't, don't Longmire. This is Longmire. Never know. Call of Duty Black Ops Three. Could be that I'm mistaken. I, th I want to say it was around 2008 or Clone so. Clone Wars. No, it. Uh, doggone it! I can't. Bionic woman. Yes, Sexy the Bionic Woman. She genius. was. She was the. Uh, okay, so the Bionic Woman was somebody else. She was the previous generation Bionic Woman. That's what I'm thinking of. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm so. Uh, scratch is itched. Anyway, Netflix, Katie Sackhoff show. Who's a Who's in? I I'm in. I'm in. I liked her in the Bionic Woman. I li I liked all that stuff. She's she's fantastic. Uh, right, yeah, she was my favorite part of Battlestar Galactica. So I'm in. Oh yeah, she was the best. Let's talk about what we're watching, starting with you, Megan. What, what's what been filling your eyeballs? Well, Westworld, although, as I mentioned earlier, I did not see the episode last night. But uh, I have been that, – that's what I watch. Um, that's that's what I, the only thing that I watch really that's current. Um, I'm way behind, uh, way, way behind on Shameless, only on season two of the U.S. version. Am I the only one that watches that? I've never watched Shameless, no. Oh, it's very good. Not sci-fi. Uh, but and then I am, I think, a season behind in Better Call Saul, um, but it's the season that just came on Netflix. OK, uh, okay. so you're watching exclusively through through Netflix. Yeah, well, no, Westworld's through HBO. No, now. I, I, I'm sorry. I mean, Better Call Saul, like 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 you're yes. intentionally waiting for him to hit Netflix. So so like when the new season starts, you're not going to run out and get uh, AMC or anything. No, because I think I have like 10 seasons of Shameless that I can watch in between. <laughs> Um, but Shameless is my show on the treadmill, my treadmill yeah. show. Do you guys have a treadmill show? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Deep Space Nine. Actually, mine is a driving my daughter to school show, and I, I haven't mentioned it yet, but we're almost done with the first season of The Office. And I, I think I mentioned my daughter is 14, and it's the perfect age because there are so many cultural references that, I, you know, driving the car, I'm able to say, press pause, let me explain why this is funny, what they're referring to, and all that stuff. Uh, it's 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 been great. Yeah, you told Do me you she have broke, a, an broke... autonomous car. Uh, well, no, no, no. I listen to it. She <laughs> okay. watches it. Luckily, having seen it, I you know there aren't too many visuals that I need you know explained to me. We are also, all watching that as a family as well. I have a fourteen-year-old daughter too, and uh, actually, she's fifteen now, um, and thirteen-year-old twins, and we're all watching it together because they get so many references. There's so many memes. They have to watch it now. Yeah, exactly. It's it. It really is. It, it it was a cultural touchstone ten years ago, but now it's become like a reference guide that everybody you know on the internet is reference is is using as as their their lingua franca of, of memedom. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, I have not been watching Lost in Space. And uh, Brian, I felt your pain when you you said on a previous episode that your daughter watched it without you. Yeah. Because one of my boys watched it without the family. And I thought I raised him right. And apparently I didn't. Because that's the kind of show we should watch all together, and now he's ruined it for everyone. I, I agree, and in fact, I I still <laughs> I'm going back and rewatching because I watched ahead, as you heard me confess last week. Uh, but uh, I I I I've ran out of steam on that, so I still need to get back to finish that. But uh, but really, really enjoyed the first half. Well, uh, I I we we watched The Expanse uh, and Westworld, and we'll talk about those in spoiler in time. Avengers: Infinity War, we will talk about in spoiler in time. But I took the Brian Brushwood challenge. Brian cashed in his friend card, uh, not his only one, but he cashed in a friend card. Uh, <laughs> I cashed it in. I'm out. That's it. Uh, You're Tom and, Solo and from now on. <laughs> I agreed to. <laughs> That's right. That's how they got my name. Wait, do I still have a friend card? I mean. Well, it's oh been yeah, a long time. I actually okay. have it in my filing cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> it, is it is an actual card. I do. Uh, no, but I, I watched one episode of Sex House. That's what I agreed. I would watch one episode, and as I'm sure Brian knew, as soon as I watched that one episode, I was I was in all the way to the end. Uh, have you heard of this? It's a show from The Onion, Megan. No, I have not heard of Sex House. I saw that, and I said, "This is not the Tom that I know." I didn't even look it up, though. Um, so, I'm a fan of The Onion. It's a faux reality show. So the sex house is is kind of gives you the nature of the setup, which is it's a reality show taking times 10, right? Like, so instead of a conceit, like we've put all these singles on an island, they just like, we put all these people in a house to have sex. <laughs> okay. They actually say six attractive Americans all in <laughs> one house to have lots of steamy sex. Okay, I have but, to watch this. Is it like a very fatal murder? Did you listen to their podcast from the Onion? Uh, no, but but it sounds very similar in conceit. Yeah. Um, but uh, I I don't know how a very fatal murder ends. But I'm so glad Tom watched the rest of it because there is zero percent chance you will predict where the whole series ends up. And I was talking about on the Weird Things podcast what a tragedy it is that fewer than ten percent of the people who click play on episode one make it to episode ten because episode ten ends in a very different place. It's pretty great. And uh, we're, we won't talk about it because it takes some twists and turns. But if you're like, I don't know, I I don't even need to see a parody of of, of some sexy reality show. Do yourself a favor. Watch a couple episodes. You'll you'll start to figure it right out that it's not what it seems pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I highly recommend a very fatal murder. Do you guys you guys need to show about podcasts okay. because that apparently is what I have more information nobody, about. Yeah. Nobody listens to podcasts. Actually, I I, I would actually. <laughs> I would love an excuse to listen to more podcasts because I okay. find myself I'm all caught up on my podcast and I haven't picked a new audio book to listen to. So maybe Tom, you want to start another show? The three of us? Yeah, yes. sure. I, I yes. got nothing but time. Do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have. Yeah, I have nothing but time too. So yes, let's do it. I mean, none of us have nothing but time. I like your but, style, um, Megan. <laughs> Mm-hmm. All right, let's see what hey uh, what Bryce is on the lookout for. Hey, I got an update. I recommended this show last year, and there's a new season of it. So I'm really excited Yay. to announce that Netflix uh, has season two of 3%. Uh, if you don't remember, the show follows a bleak futuristic civilization where uh, resources like food and, and power are are on, are really scarce on the, uh, the what they call the mainland. Uh, and w- the only way out of that life is to take a test that all 20 year olds do once a year called the process and only three percent of the people who take the process are allowed to uh, move off of the mainland and go to the offshore and it's it's a place of beauty and and bounty and free food they, they show some of the offshore in the first episode and there's like buffets just kind of <laughs> out in a park it's it's it, it, anyway uh so season one sort of followed uh, a bunch of young adults as they go through the process and season two follows almost uh in, not long after that first season um as the people who are part of that process kind of live with the results of where they end up and it's it, it, it's I'm, I'm glad to see that the scope of the show expanded i was almost worried that uh every season would just be here are the new people doing the process and it it seems like there's a little bit more continuity uh going on uh there's still a lot of politicking and drama and espionage and and there's a resistance called the cause and 
uh, uh, people playing both sides and brainwashing and spy craft. It's very cool. Um, and I think if you like something like the idea of Hunger Games or Maze Runner, uh, but you want a little more meat to the drama and to the action, I really think you would like uh, 3%. It is on Netflix now. Season 2 just came out, I think, on Friday. And it is Brazilian, uh, so there is subtitles. I wonder if there might be a dub. I, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, there is a yeah. dub. In fact, I actually started watching the dub because I realized that the uh, the subtitle version was requiring my full attention mm -hmm. and I couldn't play Hearthstone while I was watching it. Sure. Whereas the dub version uh, is clearly not as well acted as the Portuguese version. Like, if, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think if you wanted the full dramatic effect, if you're giving it your full attention, I really dug the subtitle version. But, you yeah. know, the, the, the translated version was okay. Yeah, and I think Netflix's dubbing work lately has been... All right, has has been pretty good. Well, and and in fact, you know, I'm a big fan of the uh, visual description yeah. uh, track, right? And in fact, before uh, Megan, before we were watching The Office, we were, mm -hmm. I was listening to an entire season of Netflix's Voltron with just the audio description, where it's just like you know, four awesome robot or five robot lions all formed together to create an awesome robot man, mm -hmm. and yeah. now he's slashing stuff up. Yeah, the only bummer is that Netflix seems to be making those for the native languages that ah, these shows are made in. Got so it. I think there is one for 3%. Or but not one with the visual description. Yeah, track. not okay. an English visual description. Yeah, attractive people walk down a white <laughs> hallway. They're wearing jumpsuits. I don't know why you This one so... looks really moody. <laughs> I mentioned 3% on the other show today, and you also brought this white white hallway. That's because that's I only have the one bit. That's that's all. <laughs> that's the only way I know how to make fun of all those YA movies. Uh, but check it out. I, I also think that the CG and some of the tech high tech stuff that they show off in three percent especially in season one is kind of cheap and chintzy but there's something um uh i don't know there's character to it being very <laughs> uh cheap <laughs> okay right so, on it feels more foreign <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it feels like they try it's character building is yeah. that what you're saying <laughs> you'll, you'll be character so that's uh three percent on netflix all right. If you got something we should be on the lookout for, email us, cordkillers at gmail.com. Tom, I've got uh, a terrible problem. I've got a terrible problem. I read I, one of my favorite sci-fi novels of last year. I read it, and it's over with, and it's all done. Pilot X was a great book, and now there's nothing left in my life, and I'm hollow and all alone. There's no hope left. I'm sorry. So you feel kind of like Pilot X at the end of that novel, but yeah. Guess what? In fact, but the pro yeah, yeah, you know what the problem is? I talk to my car, and my car doesn't talk back. My yeah. car doesn't have like clever, witty wit repartee like like his spaceship does. What you need is another story with an arc of redemption where he can re get over his guilt, search for pie and coffee, and have great conversations with his timeship Verity. Tom, that, look, I don't want to read fan fiction. I want to read the real book by the real author. Jeez, what are you doing? I'm asking you to buy Trigger for pre-order at Inkshares.com, Brian, because if we get 750 people pre-order Trigger, you can go on more adventures with Pilot X. <laughs> Dude, I really, really enjoyed Pilot X, and I'm not going to lie, people. This is me being totally selfish, because what I loved about Pilot X is it was a well-professionally produced audiobook. And if you hit your pre-order numbers, Tom, they're going to do the same thing, and I'll be able to oh, get yeah. it on Audible, just like the other no, one. exactly. So you yet to pre-order an ebook or a print book, but if we get 750 people to do that, it goes into full production and there will be an audiobook. So please go to inkshares.com, search for Trigor. T R I G O R. G O R T R I G O R. Just you know. Trigor. 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 Are you hungry? Trigor. You'll like it. Inkshares.com slash books slash trigor. Let's move on to the front lines. Disney will create live sports, news, and entertainment programming, all live, for Twitter. Content's going to be created by their channels, ESPN for sports, ABC for news, Disney channels, Freeform. Even the movie studio is apparently going to get in on the act. I'm guessing talking to you know, celebrities about the movies they're going to be in. Uh, but uh, like high-level production, live programming for Twitter. So I... I... Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, uh, Megan, we, we, we've talked about uh, Twitter getting into the video business for a long time. We talked about them covering sporting events and, and of course, their you know acquisition of Periscope and so on. And I keep expecting me, Brian Brushwood, to suddenly find myself watching video on Twitter, and it hasn't happened yet. Is there anything you've watched live on Twitter? Have you watched any of the video stuff yet? 
when they first got the deal with the Thursday night football, uh, that was, I think it was like two years ago. I tried it cause I was like, well, let's, let's just see if this works. And, uh, that was really all I've watched. Actually, you know what, on the night of the election in 2016, because we do have, uh, no, um, you know, we are completely cordless in our house. I did watch some video, like, I guess I watched news through Twitter, but that's really it. It's, I mean, it's never something that I think about when I'm going to go try to find content, but it but does seem good. like a very slow wet move into this. That they've Yeah. It, like this is uh, Tom, like the fourth or fifth round of us giving this kind of story. And, and I guess I thought that by now I would have been infected by it. Yeah. I feel like Twitter just hasn't got the momentum going. I think this is a great strategy for them because if I'm using Twitter and a live thing is happening on Twitter with people talking about it, giving me the opportunity to watch it easily is perfect, whether it's an award show or a game or whatever, right? So I get it. I think they just need to have enough of this happen at once. And then they lost Thursday night football. And then they keep showing me like this hockey game is going, I'm like, great. And then I click on it and it's not a live video. So they haven't been able to put the package together enough where I feel like, Oh yeah, that's the place I want to turn. I think it's a smart strategy. Yeah. They just need to be able to achieve it. Yeah. It feels like they're just shy of critical mass to me. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, movie pass CEO, Mitch Lowe told Hollywood reporter, he doesn't know if the unlimited version of movie pass will return. As we mentioned previously, right now you can only buy a membership that gives you four movies a month. Also movie pass changed the terms of service to prohibit seeing select movies more than once for all subscribers. Any movie. Uh, really? Yeah. That's a bummer because well, that the terms is say select movies, but it, right now it applies to all of them. Yeah. It's <laughs> The selection is uh, uh, Control A, select all. <laughs> yeah, any movie you'd want to see twice, essentially. Yeah, which which is a bummer because that's one of the reasons I would get Movie Pass is so that I could go back and revisit stuff. Like I'm I'm about to pay again to go see Avengers for a second time. I'd probably watch it four more times. Yeah, and I, I guess they probably looked at the numbers and said, well, only a small percentage of people are actually doing it. So, you know, we won't affect all of them and that'll save us a little bit of money. It does look like movie pass is moving into the, okay, well let's, we, we, we ran up the cost for customer acquisition. Now we need to rein in the costs and see what kind of attrition we get and then go from there. Yeah. YouTube Have is you rolling out. Have you guys talked about Cinemia? Cinemia? Yeah, Cinemia, S I N E M I A. Yeah, we, 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 we talked about that yeah. before on the show. It's 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 a it's a more limited version, but now Movie Pass is too. So yeah. Yeah, I I tried that, but I haven't uh, got my card yet. Oh, mm -hmm. so you just just got started on it? Yeah, but I did the. It's like five ninety nine for one movie a month. <laughs> so I started small. Fair I mean, enough. There's like all kinds of plans. You can do the couples plan. You can do you know more many more movies. But I just thought, well, I'm going to be saving. Six dollars, and then I promised I'll go see one movie for five dollars. So yeah, we'll see. I'll report and back. Cinemia also is available in theaters that Movie Pass hasn't added to its to. Mm -hmm. I think in some places that's an advantage of it. Yeah, and you can see 3D movies and make advanced, uh -huh. you know, yeah. reservations. Cool. YouTube is rolling out three ad programs to target viewers of video on televisions. Uh, YouTube on TV screens lets advertisers target TV. Right now, they can target advertisements to smartphone, tablet, and desktop, so they're going to add TV to that as well. Uh, YouTube TV, the service, the cable replacement service, will now have an ad inventory available for purchase through Google Preferred. Right now, Google Preferred delivers ads to the top 5% of YouTube channels. It'll continue to do that, but you can also add in YouTube TV when you buy ads there. And a new segment in AdWords called Light TV Viewers, will target people who watch TV online but are unlikely to subscribe to pay TV. So when oh so this is specifically people who are bought the cable service or people who are watching through a Roku like like it identifies device streaming to YouTube content equals Well there are three different pro ad programs and two of them do one of the things you said and one does one does one of the things and one does the other. Clear. So YouTube on TV screens lets an advertiser say, hey, I want to make sure this ad shows up on televisions. And YouTube's like, great. Anytime our app is on a Roku or an Apple TV, your ad will show up there. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it totally does. Uh, meanwhile, Amazon has renewed a deal to stream Thursday night football. Prime video subscribers will get access to the games, but will also be streamed for free on Twitch. 
Uh, how big a deal do you think this is? It sounded, Megan, like you were saying that the football deal got you to look at video on Twitter. It, it, are you already on Prime? Do you think you'll dial in for this? Uh, I am already in Prime. And um, yeah, I don't. Uh, I might. I, I I really am not in, that interested in football. I really was interested in Twitter on TV. And that's why I sure. watched it. But I might. Yeah. It, and it shows up if you're in Amazon, if you're in Prime Video all the time. Uh, it will show up and say, hey, the Rams are playing the Vikings right now. And you'll be like, you, you might decide to select that if you're just browsing for something to watch. Hulu is not making any more seasons of The Path, starring Aww. Aaron Paul. The third season just finished streaming in March. That's it. No more. Goodbye. Um, what a bummer, because I was really intending to get into that. But you know how <laughs> afraid I am to start shows that end prematurely. <laughs> well, uh, this didn't yeah. end prematurely. They just wrapped up season three and they're like that that ending of that season that's the end of the story uh, yeah well yeah i, I fell off i really it wasn't the a cliffhanger season, ending off. or anything like that right uh, interesting uh meanwhile AFTV news found a page on amazon.com where you could sign up for more info on a fire tv cube and gadget received a scan of a manual from an uh, for an amazon ethernet adapter that contained an illustration for a fire tv cube uh, is this the first time we're talking about the cube on Cord Killers, Tom? I think so. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what are the alleged, uh, this legendary cube? Tell me, uh, is it a Tesseract? Basically, the idea is you don't have to use the remote to do the voice activation. Oh, that got it. That seems to be what all of these leaks are pointing to is like an Amazon Echo. I can just say, I want to watch Thursday Night Football and it'll just put it up. Got it. Uh, you know, we added a second echo to our house. Uh, we got one of those echo, uh, spots. It's getting real seductive. I just want, I kind of want one in every room now. It's nice mm -hmm. to have a genie that you just ask who knows the answer to everything at all times. Now you get to have the fun thing where you'll be looking at one of them and say something and, and the, the other, other one, one hears you because of some weird acoustic pattern. I already have that with an yeah. app called children. <laughs> Well, now you can have it with Amazon Echoes. Too. Okay, good. Yeah. Do your children answer you like the Amazon Echo does? Well, the, the wrong one does. Always the wrong one. I don't understand. They need firmware. But they answer your questions? Like, yeah. what's the weather? They, they they respond with more questions. It's infuriating. Yeah. What's weather? <laughs> All right, let's get to the dispatches from the front. Our first missive says, hi, Brian and Tom. I just moved from the U.S. to Canada. We were winning the cord killer revolution in the U.S., but Canada is truly the front lines. Remember a decade ago when cable companies made sure the content stayed off streaming services? Remember when there was no Hulu, Sling TV, YouTube TV, YouTube Red, HBO Go, or Prime Video? That's where we are here. We tried to find a set-top box that offered an app for Canadian Television Network, one that you could access with a remote control. I bought a Roku. I bought an Apple TV. Then I even bought an Android TV box. None of them could do this. So I took all those boxes back, and I'm currently Chromecasting things from my phone's app. I've had to give up on the lean back with a Roku remote experience, and we've temporarily given up on a lot of good content. I don't know why Canadians don't demand better. That's your news from the front. Please send reinforcements. Brian. Man, this story is so much more interesting knowing that it's from somebody who lived in the land of cord cutting plenty and is now, you know, like like in the savage lands, the savage hinter great white north. Uh, our Canadians, hearts... send us hope for Brian to cordkillers at gmail.com. <laughs> is there anything he can do? Actually, that's a really good question. Yeah, I, I, let's hear some upsides on this because we had been hearing lots of really good news from Canadians. And I don't know if just like we're, if Brian's been spoiled from his time in the U.S. or if uh, it truly is as bleak as he makes it sound. Meanwhile, from the United Kingdom... Matt writes us, uh, hey, Brian, Tom, and Bryce, just wanted to drop you a quick email about an upgrade I've just done. I retired an HTPC I bought eight years ago for about 280 pounds. It was a Zotac Ion Mini PC with a small SSD running Windows 7. It's been replaced with a totally silent Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with a memory card case and IR receiver, all for under 
50 pounds. That's less than 20%, which uh, uh, which is an amazing 230 pound savings on my original HTPC setup. It's capable of playing back newer H.265 encoded 1080p files, which the HTPC couldn't, and as an and can act as a simple NAS for my other TVs to stream from. The added bonus is that it's so small we can easily stick it in a bag to take on holiday, which is great for the family to watch a film together on the TV wherever we go. The needed streaming, uh, or the, uh, we needed something like that, which could work with Without any data, Wi-Fi, or mobile connection, and this fits the bill perfectly. I blogged about it, and he gives a link to us, which we'll put in the, the show notes, but if, that's at Matt Collinge, C-O-L-L-I-N-G-E dot WordPress dot com. And he says, keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Jeremy wrote, hey, killers, I'm listening later in the week than normal to episode 217, so you may have already gotten a bunch of responses to this, but I subscribe to Stars. HBO and Showtime through Amazon channels. And while I, like Brian, thoroughly enjoy the Prime Video experience wherever the app is available, I do have occasion to use the apps outside of Amazon. Particularly, my daughter has occasion to use them on her Apple TV in her college dorm room. In my experience, each of the services make it really easy to use your Amazon login for the service. Catch is, you have to do it at the service's website. You select Amazon as your TV provider, then log in with your Amazon account info. This is also true if you subscribe through Hulu or another over-the-top service, then authorize your Roku, Apple TV, whatever, as you normally would. Man, we got we got controversy here from Michael. He says, is it spoiler free or spoiler filled? Our newborn baby. Oh, he's got a baby. He says, our newborn baby prevented me from seeing The Last Jedi, but a recent after talk spoiled redacted. It's not the end of the world, but it really uh, but it's not really clear if those uh, that are spoiler sensitive can enjoy after talk immediately or if they need to ensure that they caught up on their, all their, their content before consuming. So which is it? For those of you guys who don't know, for our patrons, we do a benefit where we keep the recording going a good uh, t- uh, 10 or 15 minutes mm-hmm. after we're all done with everything. It's a bit of chit chat, a bit of uh, uh, talking through, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just an extra 15 minutes to hang out with us like you're there in studio with us. To be honest, we hadn't come up with a policy or really even talked about whether or not it was spoiler territory. And to be honest, I feel I feel like the default for anything is it's meant to be spoiler free unless you tell people. Right. We've never told people that spoilers were coming. So we assumed it was spoiler free. So the question is, it is after talk spoilery. It's not meant to be spoilery. Right? The, que- the question is whether, step. whether the qu- months after the Blu-ray, Blu-ray release of The Last Jedi, is are we in fair territory land where yeah. we can assume that, that, that everybody knows significant plot points? Because I get where Michael's coming from. He's like, hey, man, I would have seen it if I could, but I couldn't. Right. You know, so, so I hate being spoiled. Megan, Megan, how do you feel about this? That's a good question. I mean, uh, I, I've been there not being able to see movies uh, when you have a baby. So I do feel for him. Um, but yeah, is The Last Jedi, can you see it anywhere? You can see it on Blu-ray, but you can't see it. Yeah, we're, we're now in the territory you can where... You VOD, too. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's video on demand. It's it's. Okay. I, I, I feel like there's got to be some point at which we sunset spoiler, uh, or at least, I don't know, our I think policy. video on demand is good. That's a good... I don't know, man. If you want to avoid trouble you don't spoil well then we should not talk about movies on our movie review show I, know. This is what, it, I, I don't want to go off on this rant again but it used to be it wasn't spoilery unless you said the thing the twist right right Which, actually the thing he's talking about was kind of counts as one of those big events right the big thing you don't say what happened in sixth sense you don't say soil and green is made of people Right. Yeah. You don't say Spock it. dies at the end. Yeah. You don't say Rosebud was a sled. You don't I, say I think you, you don't do those for years. <laughs> okay. Right. You don't Is do those years? for years. Is the line at years, though? Oh, I for, don't know. For the big things, for the big twists. Right. I mean, would you do it about a book? If you read a mystery, would you be like, oh, well, the book's been out for 10 years. Let me tell you how it ends. Um, well, True. you you wouldn't say that because you wouldn't be talking about a book and then randomly interject a spoiler. But, no, you but if would you're talking about books, you talk might in say public. Like, well, I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but it's well, really great. But but that's not what we did. Um, we we were sitting there talking about To Kill a Mockingbird, and then I said, "Oh yeah, and that part where where they made a snowman and and the hobo was not really drinking booze." And then somebody's well, actually, like, "Whoa!" I would I would say it's more like Grapes of Wrath, and you talked about George. You are not doing this. You are not. That is, uh, yeah, dude. Lenny shoots George. Uh, no, George shoots Lenny right That's in the head. That's not grapes of wrath. 
Uh, oh yeah, that's also mice and men. <laughs> that's it's a mice. Mice. <laughs> That would be a wild face of Thank you, Megan. Spoiler. God bless you, Megan. Thank you for work. being here. <laughs> yes, our show will be podcasts on American literature. <laughs> um, but also, th- also, movies and TV show are quicker to watch than books. Uh, that's true. Uh, I, I, Tom, I do, do yeah, you feel like... Point. It's not about how quick something is to watch. Uh, do, do you feel like it's in a... <sighs> I feel like you should never, you should err towards never spoiling the important twist in a movie. Soylent Green of People seems to be the exception that everyone's okay with, right? But it's the exception that proves the rule. People don't like it when you tell them what happened in a movie they haven't seen. Okay, That's important. But what I don't like is that we've gone the other way to where you say like, Hey, he wears a green jacket in, in the second act. And you're like, Oh, spoiler. Thanks a lot. Now you've ruined it for me. And it's like there, I think it should be reserved. Don't say anything for the first few months. Right. And then, but but, but in that the, case, that's, the that's big a plot element should be reserved. It's just, it's just rude. You can't assume that everybody can see everything. So the big twists, the big plots, how it ends, you should never spoil those for the most part. Rogue One? Like, would you spoil the end of Rogue One at this point? No, not not if I think someone in the audience or someone in the room might want to see it. I well, wouldn't spoil okay, so if I'm making a metaphor and I'm talking about like, oh, it's like so-and-so, like what happened at the end of Rogue One when thing happened? You're saying don't say that in public? I'm saying if you don't want people to get angry at you for spoiling oh. something they wanted to watch, then yeah. Then well, you- if you haven't watched Rogue One yet, then... I have no sympathy. For you. Uh, that's, that's the thing. Is like, well, a, I think I, I I don't know that the thing that we redacted from this letter was like the the big biggest twist, twist in the movie. In the yeah, movie. no, it was it like isn't, it, it isn't, isn't a big. It was a, it was the, the kind end. of element I would normally keep under wraps because it was a surprise. Okay. Uh, right, you're the one who is always like, "Oh, the coolest thing about a thing is surprise." You should go in knowing as little as possible. And now you're saying, "But I should also be able to tell everyone all the surprises." Wait, you, you know who you, Dad? I learned it from watching you. <laughs> you, you're the one who instilled in me, like Brian, it will never be enough. However much you hold back, it will never be enough for the spoiler-minded. Uh, they will always find something to get angry at you about, and you it's true too. I'm and, saying and, that, and that's where this conversation started was with me saying the line used to be here. Like, don't tell the ending. Don't tell the big twist. Everything else is fine. And and it's gone the other way to where now we have no rules because everybody's like, well, I, so I can't even discuss it. That's it. I, I'm feeling constricted. So at, our our philosophy is yeah. we are not ever trying to spoil you on anything. Yeah, and in fact, uh, please, please don't throw the S word at us because that implies that you are attempting to reduce somebody else's joy when they experience this thing. And that's not anything we would ever do. We have historically always taken a moment. If it's ever everything in spoiler time will be spoilery. We're going to talk freely about plot on, on everything, everything in the show. We're going to try to be mindful of all that stuff. Um, same for after talk. Like that's but, that's the main question is like in, after talk. I think after talk should be the same as cord killers. I agree. I agree. But that means that. In Cord Killers and and in its previous incarnations, we've always felt liberal about saying, hey, I'm about we've said that that's why we started saying spoiler alert. And we even had the spoiler alert sounder is because we would let people know we're about to talk about elements of this thing. You might want to jump ahead if that's the case. Uh, I was very conservative about that and not and, and and held back from saying any plot points just in case. Okay. Well, so in, and unfortunately, I don't remember all the specifics of this one moment of us casually talking after the show was over. <laughs> uh, I, I will endeavor to, if we're ever talking about media, be very clear when I know I'm about to talk about a plot point of a thing so that everyone has the opportunity to get away from it. How about that? Sounds good to me. But Megan? I don't know that I will stop wanting to talk about plot points Brian of things. Brian doesn't want to be uh, doesn't want to be muzzled, so he's he's not making any promises, people. 
Yeah. Megan, can I have your blessing for that? I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. I, that's all I, I need. That's, 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 all that's the whole reason we had you on. <laughs> We're all good. Uh, we got a lot of emails from folks about the idea of Netflix buying theaters. Now, we know that Netflix apparently has turned away from that idea for now, but who knows? They might go back to it sometime. Uh, so Bryce went through and summarized some of the main points for us. Uh, we got one from John who wrote in and said the cinema experience may be a good for one-off viewings for non-subscribers. He mentions, uh, for instance, show the movie Annihilation to non-subscribing friend. Kaylee wrote in and suggested they could be spaces for all-day binge sessions, live, interactive, MST3K, Rocky Horror-type shows, premieres with Q&A or commentary, even live screenings uh, of concerts or events. Speaking of which, on, make- on this one, Tom, it made me think of the early punk rock days of the Alamo Draft House when they would do everything from, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they would show old footage from uh, Andy Kaufman bits to having Atari 2600 tournaments and stuff. They were a little bit freewheeling back in the day, and it might be fun to have Netflix take a similar attitude. They also make good spaces for market research and test screenings, says Kaylee. Uh, Robert wrote in and said Netflix could intend to make money screening traditional blockbusters or include a movie pass style subscription with or alongside a Netflix subscription. There's money in concessions. He also mentions a Stranger Things pop up in Chicago that Netflix uh, cease and desisted. Having a physical space could make themed events a top tier event to go to. Netflix was really nice about that. We actually talked about that Stranger Things pop up on the show. Uh, Jeff wrote in and said he might not ever pay full price to see a Netflix program, but he might pay a marginal fee like five dollars or use movie pass. He'd go see something if he only had to pay concessions. And Chris wrote in and mentioned physical locations would also be good outlets for physical merchandise. I could absolutely see Netflix saying, if you have a Netflix subscription, you'll get in to see the movie for free and then sell you a bunch of merch and concessions and stuff like that. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, they might do like a token amount of like $2 movie night or something where it's just like, hey, just pay something so that you reserve your spot. Because otherwise, if you if you make it totally free, people will claim spots that they won't come and experience because to be honest movie theaters they're not running on ticket prices anyway all, almost all that money goes to the, the movie producers uh the local joints really do make their money on the concessions and then uh finally uh we got a uh, a note here that says uh the counterpart intro apparently contains a diamond club symbol uh you know nothing ain't no apparently about it that looks like a diamond club symbol all over the place on the on the apps on the visas that was a good catch uh it's funny once you get dialed into looking for that uh, less than greater than thing how it just shows up everywhere yeah uh well thank you megan maroney for joining us Thank you for having me, and I'm so glad we uh, we came up with some alternate uh, shows we can all do together, so that this party never ends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, tune in for Pod Killers coming soon. <laughs> Pod Killers with American literature. <laughs> if folks want to find the other things you're doing, where should they go? Uh, they can go to meganmaroney.com. They can go to twit.tv. Um, they can subscribe to iOS Today, which is the show I do with Leo, and they can uh, subscribe to Tech News Weekly, which is the show that I do with Jason Howell. Our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com. And we're live on twitch.tv slash night attack, which is also carried through diamondclub.tv Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We will cut your cords again next week. Hey, guys, Brian and Tom here, and it's just the same old message at the end of the credits, just like always. That's right, Brian. Nothing new here except your name showing up. Oh, my gosh. Because I've you got a just name. supported us on Patreon. Yeah, all those $5 donors. Look at that. That's your name in pixels. We're going to make you famous, kid. Put your There's name in pixels on the internet. There's classic names in there, but some of you are new. Some of you aren't there. It's sad. What can they do, Brian? I mean, they could go to patreon.com slash cord killers and pledge $5 an episode to be one of these amazing people like this be one. Amazing. Oh, look at look at that name right there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>